Good morning, everyone. Uh, that was Rowan. I'm sure many of you already know her because you have interacted with her. Welcome to today. This is the CUHK MBA Experience Day. Now, the MBA experience involves a lot of connections. So the theme for this morning is about connections, right? So I'm here basically to facilitate the connections. I'm not the one you want to connect with necessarily, right? Uh, so I just want to quickly introduce uh, some of our students and alumni who are going to be sharing some of their experiences with you. So you have a better sense of what this CUHK MBA experience means. Right? In, the, in, the, in, the, in the discussions, the interactions, feel free to ask anything, anything at all. Okay, And that when we have opportunities later during breaks, during uh, other ses sessions, feel free to approach any of us individually or in groups if there's any question that you wanted to ask but didn't get a chance to ask in the open forum. All right, so I just want to quickly introduce uh, two of our current students. Ben, where are you sitting? <laughs> right there. So, so, so Ben is a current student uh, in our part-time program. Uh, uh, later on, I will invite Ben to share some of his experiences and his background with us all, okay? Uh, Penny is also here. Uh, Penny is there over, over there on that side. And Penny uh, uh, also is our student, current student, uh, one cohort uh, before Ben. We also have a few of our alumni who are here to give us a hand. Uh, Franklin uh, is sitting right there. So uh, later on, you can go and say hello to him. So Franklin graduated in 2018 from our MBA program. Olivia. Yeah, sorry, I can't find all of you. So Olivia is right here. Uh, Olivia also graduated uh, not so long ago in 2020. And Frank, Frank is there. Frank graduated recently, 2021, and same as Jeffrey, right? Jeffrey is right here. Okay, so uh, these will be some of our uh, CUHK MBA, you, uh, uh, those who can actually share their actual experience because they are currently going through it or recently went through the, the program. Okay, so I just very briefly introduce myself as well. Uh, my name is Wan. That's my first name, actually. Wong Sun Wai is my last name. I often get asked, you know, what's the deal with this long name? It's very, very unusual. Uh, in fact, I just came back from uh, 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 going with a group of students uh, to Thailand. I just came back last night. And uh, when I'm in Thailand, people look at my name, they think I'm Thai. <laughs> right? So, of course, they will try to speak to me in Thai. And say, oh, of course, I'm not Thai. So, in fact, my name, the origin is I'm from Mauritius, Molekau, see? Right? Mali Chiu In Mauritius, uh, many Chinese people have these long names, which are, are three parts. So, Wong Sun Wai, that's a typical Cantonese name. Right? So, many of us in, in, in Mauritius have this uh, legacy from uh, an ancestor who went there many generations ago. And apparently what we were told is that the, the British administrators who were in, uh, you know, administering the island at Mauritius, they were somewhat less familiar with Chinese naming conventions than those, for example, in Hong Kong, right? So in Hong Kong, I think the, the naming convention was applied correctly, but in Mole Kao, see, it was done wrong, at least at the start, right? So the first uh, emigrant uh, from, from this part of the world who went there uh, gave their full name when they were asked, what's your name? And then the administrator wrote that down as the last name, which became therefore the last name of all subsequent generations. All right, so anyway, this is kind of a <laughs> little bit, uh, you know, in case you were curious about why I have such a long name. Uh, I've been in CUHK now for about six years. Um, I did my doctorate in the US at Harvard Business School. Uh, I actually worked in Hong Kong before as well, back in the days of the British, you know, handover to China. Uh, so I've been around quite, quite, quite a while. Uh, in those days, I was working in industry. I was not in academia. Um, my office used to be in Central. I still have a lot of connections with former colleagues, so we still meet regularly from time to time. Uh, but then I got interested in academia, uh, went to do my, my doctorate in the US, and then came back here six years ago after spending many years actually teaching in the US uh, at Kellogg School of Management, 
and also some brief periods in Europe at INSEAD in France and also in Singapore. Okay. So uh, you are all here today in CUHK. I don't think I need to say too much about the institution. Most of us are quite familiar. I will just remind ourselves, CUHK is a big university. It's what we call a comprehensive university. The business school is one of eight faculties. So pretty much anything that you might want to ever learn about, we do it here in CUHK, right? So the business school, of course, we have our own specialization, but we are part of a much bigger family uh, that uh, covers all sorts of different areas. So the business administration faculty is where we are today. And for us in the School of Business, our mission, what we aim to achieve is encapsulated in those few words. It's to develop global business leaders for the Asian century. Now, the first time you read something like that, you say, oh, that sounds vague. What does that mean? Anyone could say something like that, right? But I want to, to, to just highlight, you know, the, the last few words on, on, in the mission statement. The Asian century is a reality. It's not something that's a vague dream. Uh, at the beginning of this century, uh, China was the fourth largest economy globally. We are now 22 years into this current century, and the global economic order has already shifted. China is already now the second largest, and second is not like it used to be at the beginning of the century. Back then, Japan was number two, but the gap between US and Japan was very big. US has been number one for decades now right, more than a century. But we are already in the situation today where China is number two, but the gap between number one and number two is actually very small. And within a period of less than a decade, all the projections are saying China will overtake the US as the biggest global economy. Now, not only that, so I'm just picking up the top five uh, uh, economies uh, in the projections. You will notice three out of five three out of the top five biggest economies globally by the end of the projection period, uh, which is not that far from today, three of them are going to be Asian countries. China, India, and Japan is still there. And India basically came out of nowhere, right? So suddenly they are going to be number three, the third biggest economy based on all the projections that we can look at today. So the concept of the Asian century is very real. And I think, you know, we should all appreciate our position in Hong Kong, because you know, Hong Kong is part of China. And more, more than that, uh, within CUHK, we also realize this role that we can play as a connector to this Greater Bay Area notion. Now, the Greater Bay Area itself uh, as a concept, you know, if we think, start thinking about the significance of it, it's, it's, it's quite mind boggling. In terms of, my, of land area, compared to the entire country, China, the Greater Bay Area is actually less than 1% of the area. It's actually a very small part of the country, but already it houses 5% of the total population. We have all the big cities, right? Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and many others. And in terms of economic output, the GDP, already the Greater Bay Area accounts for 12% of the entire country's output. I mean, that's, you know, just think about it for a moment. China is going to soon be the biggest economy in the world. And in here, in the Greater Bay Area, we account for already 12% of that, the country's economic output. And Hong Kong itself has a very rich history, right? We all know that, I don't need to go through the details. The uh, Greater Bay Area concept is actually something that uh, you know, others have tried to compare to. There are many Bay Areas around the world, but uh, when you start doing the, a comparison like this, comparing to, for example, San Francisco, where Silicon Valley is, you again realize the magnitude of, of what the Greater Bay Area concept means. It's much bigger, whether you count it in terms of land area or population, 
you know, we are talking about a major endeavor here, you know, something that's going to have profound implications going forward. Okay, I am, this part I probably, you know, I can skip, uh, go, go through a bit fast. Um, most people here in the audience already are aware that CUHK is a highly reputable academic institution. No matter what rankings you look at, you will find CUHK very close to the top. Right, it's just a fact, right? So I'm not going to go through the individual ones. There are many more than that. I just have a selection here. And part of it has to do with the research productivity. We are here talking about the MBA program, which is uh, mainly to, you know, to transmit, to uh, convey some of the latest uh, findings in business research and business knowledge. But the university as a whole, has huge amounts of resources devoted to conducting basic research in many different disciplines. Later on, uh, you hopefully will have a chance to talk to some uh, uh, of our students and alumni who are very interested in entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship, you know, the roots of many great business ideas do not come from business schools. They come from outside the business school, engineering, medicine, you know, you name it. Right, so we are part of that big research powerhouse already. So it gives us you know, a first uh, access, first point of contact into this broader world around us. Again, I will be very brief on this. You probably are already aware of some of these facts. Uh, we have a very diverse faculty. Uh, we are a Hong Kong based institution. So you are not surprised to see that Hong Kong accounts for a large fraction of the faculty but we also have faculty from many other institutions uh, from around the world, including some of the most reputable ones you probably recognize there. In terms of alumni, you are going to be talking or hearing from four of our MBA alumni. But again, CUHK is such a big institution. I mean, you look at the map of the world, you can find alumni pretty much anywhere. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just something I, I just want to briefly mention. Now, coming back to the MBA, which is the, the focus of today, you are here to learn about the MBA experience. Typically, if you ask any, anyone who is considering or has gone through this MBA experience, there are usually one of three or a combination of the three main reasons. One is about transforming your career. You have been working in an area and you're curious about what other things there are out there that you might be interested in. An MBA is often a good signal, right? Because you're devoting a lot of energy and resources to doing an MBA. It shows to somebody you want to convince about your intentions to transform your career, that you're serious about it. I'm not just saying it, I'm actually doing something about it. I enrolled for a top MBA program and I'm going to go through the rigor of it, suffer through all the <laughs> hard work, but also enjoy all of the transformative experience. And at the end of it, you will see I'm a different person, right? So that's the career transformation aspect. Career progression is another main reason. A lot of people see the MBA as a stepping stone. And in fact, it's true. Many big organizations, they realize the value of an MBA degree. So uh, if you take your own initiative to get an MBA degree, it's again a very strong signal to your employer that, hey, I'm ready for the next step. I'm going through this rigorous program. I'm meeting all you know, like-minded peers. I'm establishing all this network. I'm now ready for the next, next part of this career. All right, so this is a big second uh, reason. The third one has to do with entrepreneurship, which I uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, oftentimes I hear from prospective applicants that they are curious about how to start a business. We always hear stories in the press, right? We know there are many successful entrepreneurs out there. And sometimes we feel like, oh, we would like to be one of those people, but we don't know how to do it, <laughs> right? There are so many things involved in setting up a business. So coming to business school, learning uh, from MBA instructors and peers gives us a good starting point. Right? It may not give you all the answers that you ever wish to find to all the questions that you have in your life, but it will give you a good start, right? and that's the important part of it. 
Okay. Now, uh, I will just uh, highlight the three things and then I will start uh, inviting our students and alumni to tell us a little bit about how they experience this. So the first one has to do with the alumni network. Okay, so uh, CUHK, in fact, uh, was the first university in, uh, in, in the world, well, in Asia, I should say, to offer an MBA degree. 60, well, 56 years ago now. I remember that because last year we did our 55th anniversary <laughs> for the MBA program. CUHK was founded 60 years ago. And I remember that because we are going to do the 60th anniversary celebrations very soon. Right, so the MBA program was launched just a few years after the official founding of CUHK as a university. And because of that long history, we have a very big alumni network. So maybe I will ask, uh, uh, maybe Franklin, would you like to start us off by uh, telling us a little bit your background and uh, uh, relating, you know, uh, the highlights of your MBA experience with CUHK? Yes, yeah, sure. Um... Hello, everyone. I'm Franklin. So nice to meet you all here. And I thank you, Sam and Roanne, for the arrangement because it's been a while for me to sit in this table. I always sit in the same row when I take the MBA class. Uh, I graduated like four years ago uh, in a, a 2018. And it sounds uh, to be a script, but actually what Professor Wen just talked about, um, career progression or, uh, or some different transformation that you may have in an MPA program is actually something I experienced over the, the, the past few years. Oh, uh, when I'm uh, studying in the MBA, I was uh, working in the telecommunication industry and I was working as a, market, a senior market manager at that moment. And Actually, uh, participating in the MBA actually helps me to uh, realize this, uh, a few things. So first of all, uh, it's about self-awareness. Uh, it is something that you will experience in the class as well because you are meeting so many students, so many uh, 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 co-workers that uh, they are working hard for their career. And then when you're in the MBA class, you realize that what you are doing good or bad uh, among your classmates, and then you know that what you're going to, what you have to be improved or what you're excel in. And then you can uh, realize uh, how your career is going to develop. So that's one of the key things that I gained in my MBA, uh, MBA experience. The second one is uh, about the uh, career progression. I'm not, I didn't explicitly ask, but I'm quite sure that um, my uh, initiative to take an MBA at that moment is one of the factors that brings me to the current uh, institution and have a, some kind of a progression in my career. So um, that is one of the key moments in my career that um, I know that what I pay for the MBA is worth, super worthy. <laughs> and then um, also about the uh, alumni community that Professor Wen just highlighted. Because actually, uh, I have over the past six months, I guess, I realized how important the alumni community uh, uh, is for me because it's a perfect icebreaker. So whenever I meet a new uh, business partner or something, someone that I didn't know at all, and then they're trying to like establish, establish different kind of a business uh, a partnership with a company, so uh, it's always tough to start a conversation or maybe uh, get to know each other, like to feel close at all. But when you talk about, oh, I took an a MBA uh, a few years ago. Oh, which university are you in? Oh, I'm in CUHK. Uh, oh, uh, me too. I'm in the MBA or EMBA uh, uh, classes uh, like few years ago or maybe a dozen years ago. And then it's just like you're meeting with friends at that, at that immediate moment. So the alumni number is actually perfect and actually is one of the most uh, important factor when I consider uh, taking which university for my MBA and is uh, proving it again and again to me that is helping a lot. So um, these few factors are actually quite a perfect setting in CUHK and I'm not really sure whether I'm uh, uh, talking too much about the other topics as well, as well but actually the uh, field trip study and also the uh, applied entrepreneurship courses in CHK MBA is also a perfect 
one for uh, any of you to take part in because actually when I graduated from my MBA, I, I somehow got the courage to quit my job and join a startup with my friends. Uh, that's a sad story at last, but <laughs> but it's a uh, it's a great experience for me to uh, to gain over the uh, it should be like maybe a year, and then we failed unfortunately. But most startups fail eventually, so uh, we have a, a courage to take uh, experience to uh, start a startup. Uh, we learn how to do a fundraising. We learn how to pitch to potential investors, and then even though we failed, but these experiences quite crucial for me to bring it into my uh, previous or existing company to do, it. we call it entrepreneurship. So you're taking an entrepreneurial mindset into a company, a big corporation, and then you can make it uh, creative. You can make it, you have a sense of uh, full ownership when you are doing it. And then of course your uh, employer or your supervisor will definitely see it. And then it helps your job as well. So these are all the fascinating experiences I have when I uh, take the MBA classes. And that's just part of the sharing that I will have. I'm sure that we will have more time to discuss in the later uh, uh, forum or in outside. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Franklin. Uh, Franklin didn't mention he, he's now with Ocean Park. So uh, if you go visit Ocean Park, maybe you might see him. <laughs> Unlikely, I would say it's a big place, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, so I, I hope you also caught one of the key messages from Franklin. Taking an MBA is part of a long-term plan, right? You don't necessarily expect to receive immediate benefits as soon as you enroll on day one, right? That's not the way it works. It's all about establishing connections. And once you establish those connections, you work you know, over the long run to you know, benefit not just yourself, but also the people in your network. Right? That's, that's how we get this feeling of, you know, we are part of a big family and ultimately we want to be able to give back to this family. So maybe I will ask uh, Olivia to also share with us a little bit of her experience. Uh, uh, Olivia uh, graduated uh, not so long ago. Uh, and currently, she's serving as a, a member on our MBA advisory board. And that's indeed another way of giving back, right? Because we can now benefit from Olivia's insights. She went through the program recently herself, right? So she can tell us as a program what kind of things we need to pay attention to. So Olivia, would you perhaps quickly share some of your experiences yes. with us? Thank you, Professor. Hello, everyone. This is Olivia. And interestingly, I'm also sitting in the exactly same position that, that I used to sit in the class. I'll tell you why this is a sweet spot because you have a quick entry to the class when you're late and I used to be late. So this is a sweet spot to sit actually. So yeah, so I shared that with you, Franklin. Uh, well, to begin with, uh, my experience with CUHK has been tremendously um, self and life uh, reflective, I should say. Uh, the reason I say this because I graduated in the year 2020, uh, a sweet spot between two difficult times. Uh, I'll not get into those difficult times once again because we talk about COVID every time and it's not something that we should be talking about. Uh, so, well, to begin with, uh, when I joined in the year 2018, I joined uh, the part-time course. So uh, for my experience, uh, time management has been a pivotal uh, thing that I learned within my CUHK program because I was juggling between uh, work, traveling, and uh, MBA courses as well. And I pretty much, I was very sure that even if I'm doing a part-time, I wanted to be as involved as possible with the courses, with the uh, lectures, with the uh, trips, with um, any other events and competitions. So I tried to give my best and uh, I had the privilege to be a part of uh, a Harvard conference, a part of United Nations conference, and a part of another international conference, which I can't remember exactly, but uh, I'll come to that later. Yes. So. The MBA experience is not just within the classroom, it's far beyond that, and it even stretches beyond the geographies of the place that you're having. So with these conferences, with these competitions, I met MBA graduates across the globe. So MBA World Summit is where I met uh, MBA graduates from uh, Europe, from US, and you kind of shared the same experience. You learn from them. You know what's happening with the world um, with MBA graduates. How are they being envisioned within the company? How are they being envisioned by the society? 
So that kind of is extremely reflective and you ponder upon your decision and you feel that, okay, okay, I have invested a lot and I know it's expensive, but uh, that did not go in vain because the kind of experience that you gain is far worth more than what you have actually uh, paid for it. And it's a lifetime membership to uh, professors who are world-class professors and uh, alumni network who are spread across geographies, spread across different industries and companies. So uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, which also is quite similar to what Franklin said, is as soon as I graduated, I quit my job. And you will hear a lot of these experiences from people. The reason being MBA program teaches you to be risk taking. When you're backed up by COHK, you don't worry about your job. You say that, OK, let me quit my job. No problem. I'll find something or the other because you're backed by your organization or, or an institution like uh, COHK and you have the alumni strength with you. So most of the friends of mine had this courage to quit their job, which we wouldn't have done otherwise. So that's the kind of confidence it gives you. Uh, one uh, aspect about MBA program that uh, excited me a lot was entrepreneurship again. Like Professor Van also pointed out, you cannot learn entrepreneurship through courses. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to get uh, bullied by investors. You have to get, yeah, you have to get pinned down. I have no other word to explain apart from bullied. Yes, uh, so they will challenge you. They will tell that you are worthless, but that's how you know how to know your worth, actually. So that's the kind of experience that I got within the program, Applied Entrepreneurship Program, of course. And then uh, another course that I had taken was Social Entrepreneurship because I wanted uh, to give back to the society. That's the kind of ethic that I believe we all should have, uh, no matter what program we are undertaking. And uh, I got the privilege to actually uh, form a group of people where I could take a social entrepreneurship venture forward. So yes, uh, MBA teaches you a lot of things. The most important thing that it teaches you is that no matter what you're doing, you always have time for side hustles. You'll see a lot of people taking, undertaking um, consultancy programs, undertaking entrepreneurship, or even just going, being part of institutions teaching them. So that's the kind of experience that it teaches you that you're not just meant for a nine to five job, you're meant for much more than that. So yeah, that's my key take away from here. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Olivia. Um, I just realized both Franklin and Olivia brought up the cost, <laughs> right? The cost of an MBA. Of course it's not cheap and Hong Kong is not a cheap city. Right. We will talk about tuition later. Right. So we'll, we'll keep that topic for later. It's not the main focus right now. Um, OK, so I, I, I want to uh, briefly explain also to our audience the. The relationship the CUHK MBA program has with alumni, you just heard from two recent graduates. We actually have uh, alumni who go back decades, right? So Paul Chan is an alum of CHK MBA. There are many others, uh, CEOs of Swire, of Ernst & Young, uh, you know, many, many different organizations. So we actually run several schemes where we promote interactions between current students and the group of alumni that we have. I will just highlight two of them, right? Just so you have an idea of how we organize these kinds of things. We have something called an elite mentorship program where we invite alumni who are very, very senior in their organization. Some of them, you know, even they have, they have already retired, but they have a lot of wisdom to impart that they want to share. And they are all very keen to meet current students. They all very much like these interactions. And so we run an elite mentorship program. So later on, I might ask maybe Ben or Penny to tell us some of their experiences with that where we, uh, you know, we, we, we facilitate uh, uh, small group meetings. So typically it's even one-on-one. -on -one. one current student meets with one senior alum to reflect on life experiences, on words of wisdom. It's basically a mentor, right? Somebody who helps you realize your own potential. But we also have the, uh, you know, we understand that sometimes, you know, senior alumni who have already retired or are extremely senior in their organizations, they, they may not be able to help you with the immediate concerns that you have, which is how do I find my next job? <laughs> they are far removed from that, right? So we have something called a career advisor scheme. 
where we invite more recent graduates, right? So they are, they are people who graduated not so long ago. And again, you know, our alumni out of their own kind heart agree to, to, to mentor and guide our current students in career advisory uh, matters. Right, so we have multiple types of, uh, of, of, of involvement between alumni and current students, which are designed differently based on what we are trying to achieve. So, so I don't know, maybe Ben, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experiences with uh, these kinds of uh, programs? Well, unlike Franklin and Olivia, I actually do sit here every single week, Saturday, Saturday morning <laughs> and afternoon. So it is very fresh in my memory right now. Um, because my, my experience compared to the others is perhaps a little bit limited, um, being a first year student, I don't have that much to draw on. So instead, I was asked uh, to think about why would I want to choose an MBA, why CUHK, and most importantly, why Hong Kong as well. Doing an MBA was in the back of my mind for quite a few years, actually, which links back to Franklin's point that this should be a long term plan. But in my early, uh, early to mid 20s, I felt like I did not have the appropriate amounts of experience to really get uh, the most that I would be able to out of the program. So I waited a few years. I went, uh, went back to work, ended up working here uh, for six years now. And then I applied uh, to CUHK. And something that uh, Professor Wan also touched on was um, the career progression that you expect to get from it. And of course, everyone wants that. You want a return on your investment. It's a lot of time and money that you'll be putting into this. But at the same time, I don't feel like that should be your only reason for pursuing an MBA. For me, the uh, one of the primary other reasons was I wanted to pursue the knowledge that an MBA would offer. I am an academic at heart, actually. This is probably my third degree now, and I just cannot stop learning. Uh, but for others, that may be for expanding their professional network. Others want to be exposed to new ideas and new methods and um, develop into risk takers as well, as Olivia said. So if you only choose one reason for your studying your MBA, then you are, in my opinion, you are perhaps not getting the most that you would be able to get out of it, should you not have other reasons that you want to study for, uh, it as well. Uh, the second uh, question was, why Hong Kong? And to be honest, I've been here for so long that I've actually kind of forgotten what it's like to live anywhere else. Um, but th this is probably more appropriate for um, maybe some of the foreign students who are listening on Zoom from the perspective of a foreigner, why would I choose Hong Kong? Um, well, the first, uh, these are both professional reasons, actually, that I managed to think of. And from the perspective of someone coming from the West, Hong Kong provides a somewhat softer landing and introduction uh, to the East Asian work culture and market and working environment. Um, I spent three years in Beijing previously, and I can tell you that from a professional perspective, I do much prefer working in Hong Kong, actually. Uh, the English is uh, spoken um, throughout the business world. It, it, it is quite rare when I have to use Chinese for work, although it does happen occasionally. So if you do speak that, that will help. Um, there are things that are... Um, in, immediately familiar uh, to you, uh, but at the same time, it is also different enough, to me at least, to remain interesting and keep me focused on what I would want to do next. And there is also another reason um, for foreign students coming to Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is actually incredibly open to foreign graduates uh, staying and working in Hong Kong after their studies, as opposed to many other countries around the world or even the region. We've, they will give you what is called an IANG visa um, upon graduation. And it's so easy to get that as long as you have a graduate certificate and a pulse, they will usually grant it to you. 
And this is something that can be renewed as well. And it and it's been what I've been doing every year since uh, since I graduated from my first university in Hong Kong. And I'm still here. And uh, these were probably my primary motivations for wanting to choose to study in Hong Kong, both originally and again right now. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for the sharing. Now, um, when it when it comes to the alumni engagement, I just want to briefly mention, I didn't put it on the slides for today, but after our students graduate, it's not just a matter of, you know, the program asking for their help all the time, right? It's like the, the people you see here, I mean, they are giving their time freely to help with the mentorship program or the advisory scheme for career guidance. But we as a program also want to keep helping our alumni, right? So it's a two-way process. We have many other types of arrangements. So for example, this idea of lifelong learning. You come here for a period of time. It can be as short as one year. You earn your degree. That's not it, right? You've spent a year learning from our teachers, from, you know, from one another in the classroom. But after that, we still want to be able to offer you the chance to keep learning. It's a lifelong process. So we have multiple arrangements. So one of them I will just mention very briefly. We have something called an alumni audit program where alumni are given the opportunity to sign up for classes, especially the new ones. When, when our teachers are offering new courses, they develop something new based on the latest developments in the field. We open the class to alumni as auditors, right? Audit, auditing a class means you sit in without needing the credits, right? Because you already graduated. You don't need the credits anymore. You don't care about grades, right? You care mostly about the learning, the new knowledge, and also meeting the people. So we have a lot of these types of arrangements as well. Okay. Um, so for the, uh, the program itself, while you are a student, we offer a lot of flexible options. And uh, I will, again, I will not mention too much about our teachers. You will hear from Tina and from Ling later uh, for the workshop, uh, the communication workshop and the masterclass. Uh, but as far as a student flexible options are concerned, there are many dimensions to it. One of them is this idea of concentrations. They are all optional, but right now we are offering six different concentrations. And uh, the concentrations are a, a way for any individual student to explore any area of knowledge in more depth and more detail. You know, you have that ability to do so if you desire. You don't have to. If you feel that uh, a general sort of generalist approach to business education is what you're after, that's perfectly fine too. So all of these are optional. Actually, right, so there are many different areas. Again, I'm not going to go through the details. You, you will have many opportunities to learn about it. Okay. We have uh, for our full-time uh, uh, offering, we can uh, basically complete it in as little as 12 months. It's quite short. If you think about it, most MBA programs globally take about two years. So for us to be able to compress it in 12 months is quite an achievement. What it means, though, is that there's a lot, much harder work involved, right? Later, again, our current students can share some of that. There's a lot of work involved, but it's well worth it in the end. Now, one of the possibilities is to do these exchanges, go learn from other schools. We have a large number of partner institutions. And if you want to take advantage of that option, you can then extend your period of study to up to 16 months, usually, right? So you take one extra term in a different country in a different institution, which means you take a little bit longer to finish the full-time program. Our part-time program uh, it usually lasts 24 months. So it, it covers two years. Uh, our part-time program is structured around weekends. Right? So you have to prepare to, uh, to, to devote time on weekends and for two years in order to be able to complete all the requirements 
of our part-time program. We have many other options. I'm going to just talk about a few of them. <laughs> right? So out of all these options, there's only one that you need to pre-plan. That's the JD MBA. If you're interested in doing a JD MBA, you need to know about it upfront because you need to apply for JD MBA, which is different from applying for a JD or applying for an MBA, right? A JD MBA is itself an application. All the other options I show you here, you can wait. You don't have to decide right now. You can wait until later. After you've started the program, you develop your interest. You decide whether or not you want to, for example, consider doing a dual MBA degree. And that means earn an MBA degree from CUHK and also an MBA degree from another partner institution, from Europe, from the US, etc. Right, but you don't have to decide now, you can do it later. Same thing with our MBA plus program, which is MBA plus another master's. In CHK Business School, the MBA is one of our flagship programs, but we also offer many other types of masters, which are more specialized in nature, like a master's in finance, a master's in marketing, and so on. Now, sometimes our students come to us uh, without really knowing what marketing means or what finance means, because we're not from those backgrounds. Once we start the MBA program, we realize, hey, that's something I'm actually very interested in. So we have this MBA plus, which is an option. You don't have to decide now. You can do it later, which basically gives you a, a reduction in time and effort and money <laughs> to complete two degrees, MBA and then a second degree, which is a master's in finance, marketing, operations, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so basically the way it works is uh, we have an arrangement whereby courses that you take during the MBA program, if they satisfy the requirements of those other master's programs, you get exemptions. You don't have to redo them, which means you don't have to pay the tuition associated with those courses. All right, so everyone wins in the end. But as I said, these are not things you need to decide upfront. You can start an MBA, and then during the course of the MBA, decide if that is something you would like to explore. Uh, we have many international exchange programs. Uh, um, uh, would, uh, would one of our current students or a recent alumni uh, like to share some experiences there? So I will just mention very briefly, I think I said it in my introduction. Uh, we just came back from a trip, a field trip to Thailand. It's been about three years since we had the last one. I think it's the same around the world, the, the whole of Hong Kong. We are all in the same situation. Uh, around the end of September, when uh, the government announced we would move to this zero plus three regime, here at CHK MBA programs, we decided, well, now's the time. We need to get something organized. We need to provide a global exposure to our students. Now, exchange programs are one way, but exchange programs usually require long time commitment. You need to be prepared to spend a whole term in another country. You need to you know, find lodging. You need to figure out your courses. There's a lot of stuff involved in, 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 in arranging an exchange. For the business field trip we just completed, it essentially counts as one course. It's one course from a selection of many courses you can choose from. So it's not even compulsory, right? You decide whether you want to do it or not. Of course, many people want to do it. So uh, uh, that would be one other example of uh, the type of international exposure uh, that we can arrange for our students. Okay, so these are some of our arrangements, the JD MBA, the uh, dual degrees and the uh, MBA plus. Uh, these are a few pictures to share with you about uh, learning beyond, beyond the classroom. Uh, the MBA program is somewhat different from other academic pursuits because uh, it's not all about classroom learning. I mean, it's a big part of it. I don't want you to get me wrong on that, right? Especially, you know, I teach one of the core courses. My, the students who take my class know that I'm very demanding, right? I have a lot of work that I give. You know, we have to think about a lot of concepts. It's not easy. It's hard work. But it's not what the MBA is all about. There's much more than just the classroom learning. So you can see some of the pictures, you know, people are having fun, they're taking part in different events um, uh, and so on, right? Yes. Okay. 
Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Jeffrey, uh, a graduate from one year ago, and uh, very nice to meet you. And uh, very glad to have this opportunity to share. So I, I think uh, beyond the classroom, uh, this is really a uniqueness uh, for that I learned in the CHK MBA program. Uh, for example, uh, I am now the uh, one of the mentor of a uh, GBA Greater Bay Area Entrepreneurship uh, uh, Program that is actually led by Professor, Professor Choi. That uh, she actually linked us with those uh, young entrepreneurs that uh, we have the opportunity to coach them to realize their business idea into commercial. So I think uh, for a learning, uh, we always have three steps. Learning it in the theory, in the classroom, and then you may need to practice outside. And one more step is to uh, really teach someone or coach someone. So I think uh, Professor Troy really uh, give us some resourceful uh, linkage with the outside world to that uh, we can really practice. And this really deepened my learning. So I think uh, this is one of a very good opportunity for the learning outside the classroom. Uh, I think this uh, could be my sharing. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And thank you, Sam, for reminding me that Jeffrey has this experience. That's, 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 uh, that, that's one of the things I think is useful for the audience members to hear from. Um, <laughs> so back to Franklin. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Franklin on this picture. So uh, this is another one of those uh, outside the classroom learning activities. Uh, Franklin, do you want to tell us what this picture is about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, it's a great experience. Uh, one of the great experiences uh, in my MBA uh, life. So uh, uh, and actually, it actually is a great tip for you all when you join the MBA program because I discovered uh, this kind of opportunity a bit too late. And as you may, you may notice, it's 2018, which is my graduating year. I only discovered that the school is offering us opportunity to join this kind of international uh, competition uh, right until the end of my MBA <laughs> studies. So I, I actually I formed a team of two with the beautiful lady in the middle, which is uh, called Katina. Uh, we form a team of two uh, to represent CHK MBA. And we actually have to do a case study in Hong Kong and we recorded it and to submit uh, a registration to see whether we are, uh, we are eligible or maybe we are selected to join in this global uh, competition, which is called the HEC Basis Game. So uh, luckily we have been uh, selected and then we f uh, flew to Paris, uh, to HEC uh, Paris to join the competition. Um, there are 60 universities around the globe to join the competition and it's a two day intensive event, which we have a full um, real life business case to solve. So we will have a uh, team of three uh so we have uh, three teams to join together which consists of these six uh gentlemen and ladies and then we have to form uh different teams for the four different business cases uh, one of the uh item that uh, we are lucky to win is the strategy uh, challenge uh, from the Bain and company and that's uh we have uh just like maybe two hours to uh, uh to analyze the business case which i remember the case is about uh how how the local um, competitors are going to compete with Amazon when they get into Paris? Should they uh, join hand to develop a joint venture to uh, uh, offer the logistics uh, services, or should they uh, create a new venture to compete with them? So this is the uh, topics that we encounter. And we have to um, analyze the case. We have to prepare a presentation in an hour, and then we have to present it to a group of uh, judges uh, in the room. So um, it's actually an eye-opening experience, not because only on the business cases, but also on how the other countries or how I'm, are the other are MBA schools are, are doing things and how they judge things. Because for this um, uh, first place winner, actually we are uh, clo uh, we're quite close on the score. But why do we uh, eventually win the prize is because one of the uh, judges told us uh, afterwards is that we are offering uh, equal opportunities on presenting the case during the presentation in which some other groups are only dominated by uh, male students. So that's one of the core items that we didn't expect. But we just naturally think that oh, everyone should have a chance to present. And that's uh, the natural thing that we, 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 we think of. But 
eventually is one of the core items that we won the prize. So it's one of the items that we didn't expect. And oh, you know, somehow you know that other opportunities, other universities or the judges are valuing about the equal opportunity thing, even back in 2018. So it's a great experience. And of course, it's a perfect chance for you to get some annual leave and travel around, around the world. So uh, apart from this business game, the field trip study I may have want to announce is that I think it's going to resume the field trip, uh, international field trips shortly. And actually I took three field trip study during my MBA life as well. I've been to uh, Silicon Valley at uh, Germany and also to Chile, yeah. Uh, some countries are not uh, what I plan to travel around if I'm not studying MBA, but it's a great uh, experience to learn and of course to play with your uh, classmates. <laughs> so we have a great time on that. So this will be one of the uh, most precious uh, opportunity when you study with the MBA. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you for this sharing, Franklin. You, you also heard, I hope, uh, from what Franklin said, opportunities sometimes we need to grasp them. They are not put in front of us. So his team learned about this competition relatively late in the program, right? But that's the kind of spirit we need to go look for things, for opportunities ourselves and look at the great outcome that, that, that came out of, of, of these initiatives. Same thing with the presentation format, right? Nobody told them that uh, having representations from different team members is important, right? They just figured it out themselves. And uh, again, what a great achievement. Uh, very briefly, I would also like to uh, mention the Women in Business Club because that's Olivia's baby, <laughs> right? So would you tell us very briefly about this, please? About Business Club, yes, always. So, uh, so Women in Business Club, so we founded this club uh, in 2018, uh, Women in Business, nothing to do with only exclusively women. Uh, interestingly, the participants were a lot of uh, participants were equal proportion of men and women. So each uh, month we had these events where we uh, called veterans from different industries, HSBC, Swire Group, who came and uh, spoke about the challenges they face as uh, women leaders and what could be the potential issues that uh, women uh, professionals would face in the world outside. We talked about uh, pay parity. We talked about uh, interview, uh, uh, interview how women should face interviews and how they should be able to be more uh, compelling about the talents they have and uh, not shy out from any of the opportunities that they come across. So extremely interesting experience uh, organizing this club and uh, uh, going through a voting system, a literal voting system where you have to be elected to be a president. It's not just something that you can just raise your hands and you're president, it's not like that. So you have to go through a rigorous process of election. You have to tell the entire batch cohort about what you promise to do and what you promise to deliver. So those are some of the commitments that we have to live up to throughout that one year. And uh, yeah, interesting experience. What else can I share? And uh, yeah, that's it. No, that was, that's great. Thank you very much. But, but I, I, I think this is another demonstration of the flexibility that the CHKMB program offers, right? So like if you're somebody like Olivia, you think this is something you're passionate about. You know, the program is not here to tell you whether it's a good idea or not, right? We are not the experts there. She is, right? But the program can offer the resources. We can provide the infrastructure, right? The venue, things like that. And of course, you know, the, the thinking behind how to organize these kinds of events, we can also, you know, have, have some inputs. Um, ESG conference is another one of those uh, uh, signature events that we organize in CUHT. ESG, environmental, social, and governance, uh, used to be called by various names in the past, but it's a hot topic these days. And this is a 100% student-led event. It's another one of those events where our own students take their own initiatives to organize an event, which can be you know, as big or as small as they want it to be. Uh, and uh, maybe we can hear from Frank, because Frank was actually involved in uh, uh, the ESG conference a few years back. Hello, uh, Frank, uh, the full-time class of 2021. Uh, as you can see, we conducted the event on Zoom, because in my year of study, the COVID ravaged the whole world, especially Hong Kong. We can only uh, conduct majority of our activity at home. Uh, I. Still remember that 
that I chair this conference event for two years continuously. We uh, business school run this event every year and it is one of the largest uh, ESG related event in Asia Pacific. Uh, our platform was aimed focus on creating a, an exchange platform to those multinational business corporation, uh, listed company, SME, uh, market practitioner to exchange their idea on the latest ESG things, successful story, trends, uh, and the knowledge. We need to prepare the themes about the ESG every year. And the last year of the ESG conference theme was the ESG impact corporation uh, and entrepreneurship. Uh, so we, we actually uh, have a lot of opportunity to learn about the ESG issue uh, through the conference along with the how to add those value of ESG into the business. And of course, uh, how to uh, how we can make the ESG impact last long thing uh, in not just Asia Pacific, maybe the global, because ESG headline is shortage. It is the global trend nowadays. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, it, it is definitely uh, very good for our students to join it because we can learn how to do the project management, help you to do the career transformation if you want to. And of course, to meet and talk to a lot of uh, C-suite level management about, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So I invited Frank to talk a bit about the ESG conference, but of course, Frank is a lot more involved with many different things. So one of the things I will mention very briefly, we don't have it on the slides, but uh, there's this global, uh, it's not a competition, it's, it's about impact investing. So it's a bit related to ESG, uh, but it's a global initiative run out of Wharton, Wharton School of Management. And Frank was one of the student participants in the, our very first CUHK participation, which was also the very first school from Asia to ever take part in that initiative. So he has a lot of wisdom to share with all of us uh, at a later opportunity if we find time to talk more about it. And on top of that, <laughs> briefly, uh, Frank not only took part and, uh, and, 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 and had a great experience, but currently he's also advising our current student groups who are taking part in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, initiative as well. Okay, um, uh, <laughs> student association activities. So these are more like social events. You can see a lot of food, right? People like to eat. And uh, over the last few years, I've learned that many of our students are very good cooks. So I believe there are often a lot of meal gatherings in the, in the dorms, right, in the hostels. I've never been invited to any of them. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it's because uh, the hostels are quite strict, right? You, you can't have outside visitors easily, something like that. So, so, so I, that's how I justify it to myself anyway. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, coming back to the global exposure and how you know, position of Hong Kong as a gateway to China can help. We heard from Ben earlier, right? As uh, somebody from the UK who actually came here first for a degree and then continued making use of the IANG arrangement to, 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 to carry on, you know, carry out his plans. Um, this ING visa scheme, uh, some of you may be aware. So for those who are listening in on Zoom, it might be much more relevant for you. As a non-local student, the government recently announced they are now going to make the ING, the initial period uh, for which the ING is valid, uh, two years instead of one year. What that basically means is, you know, after you graduate from a program such as CUHK MBA, you automatically are eligible to apply for this ING visa, which allows you to do pretty much anything you want. <laughs> you can continue to stay and live in Hong Kong, do nothing for two years, if that's what you want. I mean, nobody would want that, but you know, if you want to do that, uh, or you want to start looking for a job in Hong Kong, you can apply for the visa, get the permission to stay for two years, and then start doing your job search. It's quite different from many other countries where you first need a job offer, and then you can apply for a visa to stay. 
So which means you do your MBA some other countries. Unfortunately, you can't find a job right away. That's it, bye bye, right? Yeah, there's no there's no easy pathway for for staying behind to 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 do the job search. But not so in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, it's actually very easy. So maybe I would uh, ask uh, uh, Penny also to share a little bit of her experience. Now, uh, it's hard by just looking at Penny to, to realize she's actually a doctor. She has a PhD. She has more education than me. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> equal, equal. <laughs> so, so, so Penny came from the US. So maybe you want to share a little bit about your, your, your thought process and, and, and what made you choose the UHK MBA. So I actually grew up in Hong Kong. Um, I went to the U.S. for high school, uh, my last year of high school, and then university, and then my PhD. Um, so when I first came back, it was more like, you know, there are a lot of opportunities in the Greater Bay Area. That was the reason I came back. Um, and a lot of people normally is like, are you sure about this? After almost 12 years in the U.S., I'm like, yeah like I'm coming back there are so much that I can do here like why not um so that was really my intention of moving back um and then as for the MBA uh my PhD was in chemistry and it's absolutely nothing to do with business whatsoever um so for those who definitely is like is MBA for me I don't have really much of a business background I can tell you yes um I'm still in the program I'm still enjoying it um and I think you know the enjoying is really the key that I want to share is that and I know I mean there are always going to be tough time um you're in school school is always tough right and uh but like you know it's always the moment where like I'm like oh I'm learning more things I am actually understanding whatever you know even accounting in a very different perspective like you know um and for me it was it, this is more of a my path for transitioning so coming back to the career transition like I'm tired of being in the lab what can I do and this MBA opened a lot of path for me it opens a lot of like you know different thinking different mindsets and like me working with my classmates who are from all the different industry uh, really definitely help like you know me to really think oh let's not think as a scientist let's think somewhere else like you know and that part has been the best thing that has been happening to me for like the last one and a half years ish um, so yeah so as for CUHK it's just that when I grew up it's always like the school that I'm like oh this is a really good school and what if like there is always one day that I can study there and I think you know, it's really the alumni network that really drove me here. Um, one thing that Professor Wen mentioned about was the mentor program. Um, I definitely cherish the program a lot myself. We had, a, I had a mentor last year. I had a mentor this year, like those are official, um, but I also had the unofficial mentors that I know through our classmates. So like I get invited to a classmates dinner with her mentor from last year and this year. And those two mentors kind of became my, like, you know, it's kind of my secret unofficial mentors. And trust me, I bug them often. I'm like, I want to change my path. How should I do it? Is there anything that like I can do to help myself to really get out of the lab? Um, I had a question on like, oh, which sector should I pick? I just go to them and ask them blank questions. And they understand because my background they really like, you know, try to make things easier for me, try to explain things, try to introduce me to um, other people that they know, like it's the connection that really just helps out. And it's been great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Penny. And also Penny didn't mention, I, I like to tell you stories of things people don't mention, right? <laughs> so so in, in our uh, in the recent uh, uh, elite mentorship uh, gatherings, uh, Penny was actually the MC, one of the MCs that, you know, to, to, to introduce the event. So thank you for doing those as well for us. Okay, um, I will uh, just share a few key messages uh, with you. So, so you already may know this, but in case you are curious, uh, for admissions, uh, we do require a minimum of two years of work experience. So some of you I talked to earlier, I think you're getting very close, right? So this is probably the right time. Um, the, uh, uh, the English requirements, uh, uh, you know, obviously this is an English taught program, so we need uh, competency and 
and, and comfortable, you know, comfort in using English uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. The tuition fees. Now, the tuition fees uh, for us are 580 for the full-time program and 450 for the part-time program. Um, by no means are these cheap, but I wouldn't say they are outrageous either, right? It's well worth it. <laughs> Now, it, it, having said that, we do realize, of course, that uh, not everyone necessarily has the financial means, right? So I want to mention, we have uh, a number of scholarships uh, that are available for applicants to consider. Uh, some of them are merit-based in that it depends on your academic work, you know, other social achievements that you can demonstrate. So those will help you gain the necessary points to be considered for those merit-based scholarships. We also have a range of scholarships that are more related to background. So for example, we have an alumni referral scholarship. We have a current student referral scholarship. Uh, we also have something, a corporate scholarship program, right? So maybe I will talk very briefly about the corporate scholarship program uh, and then uh, talk about the other types of scholarships you're currently considering. So we have a range of institutions and organizations uh, in Hong Kong and also globally, where we recognize that, you know, by virtue of being associated with those organizations, you already demonstrate your fitness for doing an MBA. So if, for example, you are a member of uh, CPA Australia or the, the, the Energy Institute of Hong Kong, right? So for engineers in the audience, if you are a member of these organizations, you will be eligible for uh, a 10% tuition uh, grant, right? Pretty much automatically, by just by virtue of being members of these organizations. Now, one quick thing I want to say before I, uh, I introduce Tina is uh, the scholarship arrangement. We have the MBA Excellence Scholarship. Uh, we have a small number, unfortunately, we cannot afford more than that, but we have a very small number of full scholarships available. And the way these work is, you know, the earlier you apply, the better your chances, because uh, the next round for applications is uh, uh, 15th of December, that will be the deadline. That's actually our second round. We have these full scholarships available for the first three rounds. Okay, so unfortunately, you missed the first round, but that's fine. I mean, there are still two rounds to go. And the full scholarship works, it's a merit-based uh, scholarship. So it will involve a panel interview, a second panel interview if you get shortlisted. And uh, if you are unlucky in rounds one and two, uh, in terms of obtaining the full scholarship, you will still be eligible to be considered for the next rounds, right, up to round three. So the earlier you apply, the better your chance of being considered and obtaining one of those full scholarships. I mention that because often our fees, they are not, as I said, they are not cheap, right? But I also said they are worth it. But even so, after having said that, it's still the case that very often I hear about candidates, applicants who really, really want to do an MBA and the fit is really there. There's a very good reason they want to do it and we think we can help. Unfortunately, the financials are not there, right? The person has a lot of difficulties. So we have uh, tried our best to, uh, to, to come up with something that might, that might uh, help all parties. Okay, now I suspect all of you already have our contacts <laughs> uh, since you're all here and attending on Zoom or in person. But uh, if you have uh, others, colleagues, friends who are interested, feel free to share our contacts with them as well get in touch with us. We are very happy to, 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 to explain you know, the nature of the program and what, uh, you know, how it might you know, uh, benefit uh, the, the, the prospects.